Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Acts chapter 1 and verse 15. Now the Bible says in Acts 1 15, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of disciples and said, The number of the names together were about 120. Praise God. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem, and in so much as that field is called in their proper tongue, Akel Dama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and this bishop preclared another text. Wherefore, of these men which have company with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of this resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Basabas, who was surnamed Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry, part, again underlined, part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Somebody say, Amen. This story is the aftermath of the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus. It was after the death and resurrection and the ascension, I believe, of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Now, Judas Iscariot betrays our Lord for some coins. And then he leads them the persecutors, to Jesus. And Peter says that this man Judas, even though he betrayed our Lord, he had a part of this ministry. What was his part? He was among the twelve, which some theologians call the apostles of the Lamb. Praise God. The twelve disciples. They are called, they, some people call them the apostles of the Lamb. But because Jesus had 12 followers, it does not necessarily mean that that was all there was. He had many. Of the thousands, there are many that were fed. You remember that? Of the hundreds, there are many that fed. You remember one time when Jesus walks, and this amazes me already, that one time Jesus walked and people followed him in the droves that people even stopped being conscious of their meal. And one time, your Lord and mine, he's ministering, and then he realizes there's no food to feed thousands of people. And some even claim that if they're talking about men, well, probably they're talking about the patriarchal men, men, but probably they don't even maybe calculated the number of children and women, because in certain accounts, it's more than once that he fed thousands with literally the absence of enough food. You've seen in scripture how he fed uh, people with uh, five loaves of bread and two fishes. And they all ate. The spirit of multiplication was there. Didn't these people have jobs? They did have jobs. But one time they abandoned their jobs because of the child, the son of God, and what they had seen in him. They left what seemed and appeared to be important for them to follow the Christ. That is how much convinced they were 
that he was the Son of God. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the Son of God. They were with him. Always. They walked with him. Always. They ate with him. Always. Are you following what I'm saying? When he was healing the sick, going about healing the sick and cleansing the lepers and delivering men from all infirmity, the people, the first recipients of those miracles were the thousands that moved with him. When he was casting out devils, there were no same folk. You understand? Don't you think that there were burials of the dead? Don't you think that there were small little celebrations within the camps that sometimes they'll call on Jesus to come and probably be with them? I mean, he attended weddings in Cana. For what we know, it's what is written. But more than that, the Son of God did a lot. You know that. You and I know that. Huh? So he gives his life to these thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. And, and if you see them following the Son of God, you'd be so convinced that if a man can leave his family, his own household, carry literally everything and follow this man who does not have a place to lay at that particular point. You remember foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of God has no place to lay, he said. It meant that he was so moving from place to place. It doesn't mean that he did not have a house. It doesn't mean that he was moving so place to place that it's almost as though everywhere he went, he needed to sit somewhere. He needed, he needed a place of lodging. And these are multitudes that are gathering. The, during that time, there was no PA system. During that time, there was no shelter like this which was seated under. During that time, all they had was open places, and sometimes he used to sit on, you know, big boats so he could communicate to many by the thousands. And they are with him. They love him. They honestly love him. Do they believe that he is a Christ? Every reason and beyond. They believe that he was a Christ because the man did miracles in their presence. He did signs and wonders in their own presence. They did not doubt that Jesus was, was the Messiah. They believed. They followed. But as situations continue ensuing, and the Son of God is getting closer to the fulfillment of the purpose to which he was ordained, we realize that because of the persecutions that were taken toward the Son of God, the numbers start reducing. Hmm? They start reducing. Because... Then the Judaism teaching that had held the name of Moses, those Pharisees, Sadducees, and Nisans started to accuse falsely the Son of God. The Bible says he was hated without cause. And then we woke up one day, and he's the Prince of Beelzebub, he's a blasphemer. You know, if you're talking about religion, there are three things that always have existed before time and up to now are consistent with a spirit of religion and its accusation towards the saints, the prophets, the men and women of God. One, they will always take claim on attack on the institution. That is why even then, if you read about Paul and Jesus and all these apostles, there's always an accusation of he has spoken blasphemies against the temple. There are men who could die for the institution because they think that the institution is the person. There are people who are so deluded in their understanding of worship that when they see the artifacts of worship, they think that God is the artifact. They would die for the temple. If you speak anything against the temple, you're in trouble. You understand? And then the second thing was blasphemies on the leading names that these religions represent. If you offend the Pope, if you offend and sometimes it's not that you have offended. Sometimes it's simply you have disagreed. Martin Luther was excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church simply because he writes that 95-page thesis that man is not justified by works but through faith in Christ. In fact, Martin Luther was not, if you read history, he was not intending to fight. He did not come with a fighting spirit. He put that paper on the Wittenberg Church to open up a debate of discussion. What happened? They excommunicated him because it was like sort of disqualifying the infallibility of the Pope. Why? Because they believe in the infallibility of the Pope, which is that whatever the Pope says, doctrinally or morally, is true. You don't have anywhere or anything to refer to if the Pope says this is right. Even if you have the Bible in your hand, it's wrong, if it's right. Even if it's wrong according to the Bible and the Pope says it's right, 
That's what they call the infallibility of the Pope. It was passed in their congresses that the Pope, whatever he speaks is true. Whether you agree with it or not, it's morally upright. He is the voice of heaven. He is the vicar of Christ, vicarious really day. You don't question what he says. Some people do not know that in the 1500s, I think 68, when William Tyndale translates the Bible into English, it's the very reason why he was killed. Why? Because certain people did not believe that the Bible was supposed to go out in the population to interpret. Men are not supposed, they believed, to interpret scripture. It was only given to a few special individuals who then could twist and make it say whatever they feel has to be said for them to have their own way and agenda. Because at first it was the Catholic Church, who universal, and it became the Roman Catholic Church. So the intents, the, the, the ideas, the structures and systems of Rome precede the idea and concept of the Catholic Church. So the Catholic, the universal church, is subject to Rome. So it's Rome first and then Catholicism. That's why it was called, it became later Roman Catholicism. Or Roman Catholic Church. You understand what I'm saying? When they were in the time of Jesus, they used to say he speaks blasphemies against Moses. You understand? So it's usually either the temple, the name of whoever they are pulled up there, or the ignoring of their tradition. Why don't your disciples do this? Why do your disciples do this? Why are you healed on the Sabbath? You understand? Some people think that because certain things work in their belief system, therefore everybody has to do them that way. If you don't do them that way, you wake out. You wake out automatically because you're not moving the way they think and the way they have established their own tradition. Let me tell you one thing. There is no cult that is accountable. You cannot find accountable people and call them cult. You understand? But you see, why? Because you don't agree with their traditions. Whatever you're doing, if it doesn't agree with that tradition, then you become wrong. And the same thing. That Paul had a problem with some of the men. Remember Paul rebuking Peter for seeing Jews from Judea coming in, and when he sees the Jews from Judea, what happens? He gets a problem. Huh? He stops eating with them because it was cultural. Even though the man was born again, he still had issues. He still feared the Jews. He still feared the Jews. He says, when Peter was come to Antioch, which stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. What did he do? The Bible says, for before, certain men came from Gentiles, and he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of circumcision. You understand? There was a tradition that the Jews were not supposed to eat with the Gentiles. Peter is a born-again believer. He has received Jesus as his Lord and Savior. But he still has a problem. If the other guys of the circumcision see him eating, and in there sometimes as a comp compromises. Peter at that particular point compromised. That's why Paul withstands him. And he tells him, it is wrong that you're doing this. How are we going to win those people over? If we do that, if we show them that traditions are more important than the relationship. If we show them that our traditions are more important than this Christ and the grace you're preaching them. How can we then win them over? He withstood him and rebuked him openly. But it was not the first time that Peter did that. You go back in history. Peter is hungry. He's on a rooftop. He's praying. He's seeking the face of God. And uh, what happens? He goes into a trance and a uh, cloth, a sheet with four uh, footed animals comes down. And what does the voice of God tell him? God tells him, kill and eat. Peter goes back to religion and the tradition of his own father and he says, for how can I eat what is unclean? Why? Because in their culture, from the Levitical teaching, it was known what was unclean and what was clean. Some people, even in their salvation, they stay traditional. There's a guy who was a Muslim, he came born again, but you can't still eat pork. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Tradition. In order to obey that tradition, you're attacking the temple, you're attacking the person. See? So persecutions arise. And there are people within the team who are like Peter. They fear the Pharisee. They fear the Sadducee. They fear the Eastern. They fear Rome. They fear what they think about them. They fear how they are perceived. They fear how we will relate to them. The people who don't even come to Fenero, they know I'm right. They know it. But they fear that if they're seen there, they will never be respected. They'll be seen a certain way. They fear. You understand? 
they fear to associate. If you deny me publicly, why do you want to see me privately? You see? There are many people who approve me privately. But when they go, they say, that guy, ah. But when, we, when they meet me, oh my God, some of them even melt. See, can we, have, can we meet for tea? There's a preacher who went around telling people, oh, that guy is what, he has snakes in his house, what, he spoke things. But when the guy meets me, he wants to meet me, he wants to ask me about ministry, how to do his ministry. And I'm like, but you do it. I am wrong outside, but when we are two here, you honor the anointing of God upon my life. There are people like that, but I know what they fear. Some have a lot of fear. Praise God. By the way, Panera is intimidating. Because how can you have deep guys, rich, anointed, that they are all in the same room? <laughs> Praise God. So that's all right. That, it's all right. It's all right. You understand? So anyway, persecutions arise and everything takes place. Things go up and about. The next thing we know, they have left. They just left. Even... The miracle. They left. Hmm? Man, being a man of God. Eh? <laughs> Some of you are asking for it. Eh? But we, we wish you know. We wish you know. It's a beautiful calling. But it has to come with enough grace. Eh? Some of the people you give priority and give your life are the same people who become funny. It's funny. You understand? Eh? It happens. So when a shepherd bleeds, if you're not mature enough to know how to multiply, mama, you can die. You understand? You have to get them to the place of satisfaction that you did what was expected of you. Some men find satisfaction in numbers, in things like that. No, a man of God's satisfaction should be that he has done his part. Whether the person fails or they don't, whether they come or go, whether they leave or never stay or stay, it's up to them but at least have the confidence that I ran my race, I did my part, I preached the gospel. That's your satisfaction. When you get that, you realize everything starts to become easier. Anyway, they reduce. They reduce. You remember the time he meets the 12, he asks them, are you also going to go? Eh? He asks them, oh, so where can we go for with these? Is uh, what? Is, 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 is the words of eternal life. You know, those did, were not for me, they were for eternal life. Now, in the death and resurrection, some other people believed the story. But they had been with them either. They were not among the twelve. And I don't think those people departed per se. They stayed in the background, in the peripherals. They were not seen directly. But they stayed believing on the Christ. You understand? And now the Bible tells us that there was a group of guys and there were 120. Those were not new converts. No. These are disciples as well who followed through. They were witnesses of everything Jesus did. So when Jesus asked the twelve, are you going to go also? Did I mean he only had twelve? No. There was another group of people that were not present that day but believed in the Christ. And they followed through. You understand? Uniquely, these people are 120. Peter accounts for them. And he says, no. There was actually a group of 120 guys who never left. They were probably hid, maybe sometimes, because Jesus needed to expound certain things in their absentia. They knew, they even felt sometimes that they were not as favored as the twelve, but they were following through. They stayed. They were with the man. Oh, let me say a number of them. As they are following, Judas dies. Yet he had a part and lot in the ministry. And now a time comes when they need to replace him to make the twelve such that they still have the number of twelve as a witness. And so what happens? They say, look, let us go to the number of men that followed, have been following with us from the very beginning of this ministry, he said. He said, for it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein, and this book bishopric let another take. Wherefore, Peter says, of these men which have come with us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among the stars, beginning from the baptism of John and to the same day that was taken up from us, must one be ordained. That means from the, from the time of John. There are guys who were following. They were quiet. They were, not, they were not in the leadership. They were not. 
seen, they were not physically there, you know, like you'll have people who have been in a ministry for so many years, you might not even know their name, but they are there, they are following, they are with you, they are praying, they are standing, they are serving, they are doing everything you expect them to do. You understand what I'm saying? So they, they are, they are, they are with him, they are walking with the Christ, they are not in the twelve. They are not in the advantage to a inner circle. Huh? They are not in those ones who knew his number, who had his WhatsApp. <laughs> but they were there. They were. You could not see them. But they were. Yeah. Praise God. Now, they needed witness of the resurrection of the Christ, to fulfill the twelve. Again, sometimes it's how we don't think for a moment that the gospel is only fulfilled when we find our path. Are you following Christian? Some of you, your simplest life is, you wake up, you work, you go to Fanero, you, you broke a bit probably, you have challenges in your work or there's a deal you're testing and it has failed to come, uh, you know, to pass and then what do you do? You, you say, let me go for a chisamon. Eh? You, take, you take someone like drugs. Eh? The world hits you badly. Then you say, ha, ah, Sunday, Thursday. You come, you stand in the back there, people are praising, you don't even understand what they are doing. Then the word comes in, Oga Apostle, hit me up. You understand? Then they hit a key, God's poor faith. Eh? You scream your lungs out. Eh? Service ends. Okay? Then you wait for Sunday. They hit you up one time. Then you wait for Thursday. Hit you up again. Then you're bored, you get it to someone, put it in your car. Of course all of you drive. Then you start listening, praise God. And then, you know, the word gets into you and then it starts to transform you. But you have not still found your path. You have not still found your path. What is your path in the gospel? You don't need to be on the committee. <laughs> Some of you think you have to first have been on the committee doing something or that cleaning chairs or putting on a t-shirt or making t-shirts or, or you know ushering and then some of you think that that's all there is. No, no. You don't actually need to be doing everything that is, is direct. Probably if you ask some of these guys later who are phoned, you might not find that probably some of them were directly in contact with the man of God or that they were serving directly, physically, but they were doing something. They were doing something. So sometimes we tell you, you know what, get five people. At least do your project 10 and tell God, you know what, I might not be an usher. I might not be a worshiper. I might not even have a nice voice. But God, I can sell. I can sell your name. You understand? There's a church member I was told about. How did I get the, the testimony? I got it in a saloon. This guy says there's a lady in your ministry. And I realized when I told you the name, this person doesn't have any part like in the direct line of ushering or something. They're not on the committee. Huh? He says, but every time this woman used to come into the saloon, she told us about God and invited us every time. And, and these guys, three of them are coming already. Because one person <laughs> took a part in their lives to reach out to these people. You might never even appreciate them or even know them. But almost all of you were brought by someone and you're enjoying this freely. You understand? But you cannot invest it at least in one person. If you don't have faith, at least in one person. And tell him, look, I'll stick on you until I win you like I was one. You understand? And so, a time comes, Judas Iscariot, Tells the master, he does. Peter says we have to look for a guy who have been with us from the beginning. Okay? And then they get Justus, the Sabbath, Joseph, surnamed Justus. And then they find that Justus and Matthias were the oldest, some of the oldest and most consistent. You know, sometimes it's like in ministry. Some people ask themselves, how do we do appointments? 
some appointments are done you see if you go back to what he said and to that same day that he was taken up from us wherefore of these men which have come and with us oh listen all the time that the lord jesus went in and out among us underline the word all the time see you can be in a ministry for five years and not be consistent you can be in a church for 20 years and never be consistent. Yet you are a good church member. Even if they check your heart, you're good. You understand what I'm saying? And there are times you fail to pray. There are times you fail to come to church. That's understandable. But thank God that he has given us solutions. You can get a CD and listen to it and follow up. But for you who is absent and you cannot follow up on a sermon, there's a problem. How do you sleep without following it up? Look for it. And tell somebody, you know what, I was not able to come to pray, but what was last Sunday's sermon? Pay every price to get to it. That's that you are in consonance as the ministry moves with the Spirit. See, promotions come from neither east nor west, but they come from God. And you see, even us as leaders, there are people we know who have been with us forever, but they have not been consistent, faithful, available, and committed, right? So you can be committed and not available. You can be not available but committed like you're absent but the day you appear my god you can change this room into purple and the people like that they disappear but when they appear they can serve it and you're like these guys have been serving for like 20 years that's how good they are you understand and I, listen i'm not judging why you're absent because that's supposed to be again that's why you remember later when they were praying they say god for you know the hearts of men it was more than them being available you understand Justice and, and, and Matthias were both men who had been there all in and out. But again, God needed to take it a little note higher. And he says, look, you can check their heart and see who carries this heart more than the other. And the Lord fell on Matthias. You understand? Because it's more than just being available. There are people who are in and out, but your heart is far. You're in the ministry because of... Uh, let me not say, praise God. But you're in and out. You're always available for every service. But for you, you have another vision. There's the way you see things, praise God. The day, you, the day things go, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, you understand? But you are there, you are, you're there, you are there. If they see you there every day, you even sweep, you do everything, praise God. But you, the Lord told me, the Lord, you make the Lord speak something. And you're doing everything because the Lord spoke something. And if that something doesn't come to pass, what happened to brother so and so? Yeah. Uh, what happened to this sister? Uh, uh, you understand? They can't explain. Why? Because there was the way you saw things. You had a vision of things. Some people are even so selfish about the gospel that some of them burned here. You enter the world, you enter the gospel in a very self man, you belittle God to your little feelings. Your small individual feelings. Then you bring shame to the gospel. The holistic line of what Jesus did not shed blood for you to waste it on feelings. You understand what I'm saying? Eh? But anyway, sometimes appointing people who have not been with us for long to understand the ministry. You just appoint a guy who because he's gifted. Mama, ay, 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 ay. he can leave you in the middle of a sermon. <laughs> because they don't respect the gospel. They don't respect the gospel. Listen, for example, if you have a job, a physical job, right? Some of you have done professional. If you've done a professional job of contract and everything, you will realize that in your contract, there is a clause that holds you accountable, at least to give a one or two or three months notification before you leave. Then you write your notice. They call it serving notice, right? And then they know during that time they are planning probably to replace you, to put in the right person huh? in the position. Then you continue serving as some of them, they tell them, look, get this person, train them everything you know before you leave. Because you need a recommendation maybe for your next job. 
or because it's best practice. You see? And then you serve that one month, or two months, some three months, even in contracts, you sign with some of these people. They tell you if you're going to change venue, notify us three months before, or else you shall serve a certain penalty for simply waking up and telling the management that we no longer need your services. Some don't even notify, they just disappear. Are you seeing what I'm saying? At the level where we're at at Panero, we can be sued for that. We'll be held accountable. You understand? If you're doing a professional job, sometimes they'll demand that one month notice. So that they prepare themselves, or they prepare someone, or they give you someone to train. You come in the work of God and send a message with effect from to them no longer serving. You come in the work of God. The work of Jehovah God, the creator of heaven and earth, the guy who owns your life, who can put a pause on you tomorrow morning. You don't even give a notice. Some don't even speak. Man, people don't fear God. Eh? Do you understand what I'm saying? Who, has, who is understanding what I'm saying? But I've seen it. Some of you know, uh, I've, I've stopped serving in security. Why? Nothing, no reason. Listen, you're a volunteer. We're not paying you. Some of you will pay, but some of you will don't. It's all right. You go. Okay? But you don't even fear God. Even on my former job in the bank, I served notice. When it comes to God, if he wants seven months for me to live the right way, I will live the right way. Because nobody's going to hold you back from no... Nobody's going to tell you, look, we insist, don't leave. No. But these things some of you ought to know. The Bible says when you make a vow before God, make sure that you fulfill it. The Bible says, for he has no pleasure in fools. Do you know why God uses such a strong term when it comes to the vow you make to serve him? It is because it is that serious. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Just saying you're going to serve God, serve him. Just saying you're committing to do something every Monday, do it every Monday. Because you made that vow before God. And that same individual thinks he's going to raise his hands, eh? And somehow blessings pour out. Eh? Overwhelming. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and then men give to his bosom. That's why many of you are stuck. You see, the Bible says that, that, that there should be order in the house of God. Order in the house of God, he's not talking about order in service. Order in service is when you know what's next praise, worship, the announcement. Then after making the announcement, worship for 10, 20 minutes, and then enters into the sermon, and then after the sermon, service is made, and altar call is made, and then people go, and then pastor go. That's called order of service. He is not talking about the order of service. He's talking about order in the house. Order in the house means that you must be very careful how you deal with the house of God, because that determines whether there are going to be promotions in your life or you're going to be stuck. Some of you are stuck because of how much you grieve the order of the house. The order of the house. You see people serving, and then before you know that, there's, there's this department, this one is not understanding the other one because the other one is favoring the other one, and then the other one's boyfriend is dear, and then the other one's friend is also in there. And then you're like, wait, now you have made the gospel of Jesus Christ a boyfriend issue? You've made the gospel of Jesus Christ an issue of I'm going to Kulemesa you. You know the other time I had an issue with you. Then I, I called you in the choir. Then you refused to come. So then even me now, eh, I'm also going to take it on you. Wow. So the people who are supposed to be receiving worship and praise, the people who you're supposed to be serving, you come with your bitterness on the pulpit and then back up. Hallelujah. And then bitterness is springing out of you. Hallelujah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? No. No. If you feel this is not the church, come and say, you know what, Musumba, release me. I feel me, I'm not called here. Then we bless you. You know, some people don't understand the concept. Why do you think Jacob refused to leave Laban without his blessing? He said, bless me, because I deserve it, I serve. 
Even if I don't deserve it, bless me. God will find me somewhere there. It's called order in the house of God. It's called order in the house of God. What do you do when a sister is fallen or a brother is fallen in the house? Because this is a family. Hello. This is a family right here. Do you go broadcasting everywhere how your little sister has fallen? Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why some of you, until you become parents, you will never understand. You will never understand until you become parents and carry a seed or a child. Some of you will never understand why Jesus died for men. You will never understand why Jesus died for men. Praise God. But see how the lots fall on a man. And the Greek word for Matthias, the translated word for Matthias, is gift of God. Gift of God. That's actually what Matthias means. Matthias means gift of God. And some of you have been there every time I've told you that children are born, sons are given. He says, to us a child is born and a son is given. What is given is a gift. That means Matthias transitioned from childhood into sonship. You understand? Matthias is a representation of sonship. As a man of God, some of you start ministries. Always appoint people you see carry the spirit and soul of sonship. Not the people who appear to be very gifted. Don't do that. It will always cost you. We've made those mistakes before. They are very costly. And they are always costly. Even in the team, you guys have small little teams, choir, what? Security, what? When people come to you and they say they want to serve, pray about it too. Pray about it. And ask yourself, does this person carry the spirit of Apostle Grace? Do they look, do they feel after this person? Can they stand in the rain? Can they, can they serve? Can they endure? Can, like the other day when we were in the prison, the man said, these guys have been here every Thursday. Even when it was raining, they sat under the trees to preach. Yeah, 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 yeah. I say this is exactly what I would have done when I was under a tree. Because I've preached in the rain. You understand? Praise God. But it's because of how we love God. It's, it's, it's how we love God. It's just how we love God. Praise God. Praise the Lord Jesus. And so, the gift takes a part of a man who lost a part. Because that's where it happens. That every time, that's why I tell people, when you understand your part, you're very careful not to bring offense to the Holy Spirit. Even if you want to change or leave or do anything, you do it in wisdom. Because you don't want to grieve the Spirit that has given you that part. Or else, you can stay anointed and your part is not there. There are men of God who are so anointed, but they don't have ministries. Because when you look at them, God doesn't have a part for them. They are gifted, it's true, but God does not have a part for them. It's like a player who is seated on the bench waiting to play his part in the 11, football. And the guy is very gifted, but the coach prefers another above him. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have his gift. No, no. He can go outside elsewhere and play very well, but not on this club. You understand what I'm saying? And probably it's the best club. And some of them ask for free transfers or loan transfers because they feel attacked. And some of them cut wires, even they shifted. A guy leaves man you and then he's thrown into Celtic. You understand what I'm saying? But you see, maybe he would have shined in a number two position of premier. You understand? And then he chooses to go to Stoke City. And then he becomes a good talent in Stoke City. Praise God. Instead of being a star in Liverpool. Praise God. What is your part in the gospel? And how do you follow the order of the church? You know why we teach these things? 
Because you see, these people don't teach these things. Some people sit in services where they tell them you have the spirit of what? You go, your dominion is on you, what? You're going up. You know the spirit, God is going to give you money. Then you scream and then you're broke. One year you're broke, two years you're broke. No, no, there's someone who's broke and has their part. That one is a matter of time. But Nange, I'm a witness that God can raise you in one day. The, you know, it does not matter how long. The issue about this thing is, when you just go for those short fixes of, hey, one day what, my, I got a bit of 100 million, what, 200, many of those guys, they lose it as it came. But when a man builds his testimony on principle, what you get, you cannot lose. Because you know the way up. It was not a simple eh, proclamation. No, you understood the patterns and principles that took you up there. You don't just fall. You don't just fall. That's why he says, make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. But there's a man who doesn't understand calling. He doesn't understand election. He's testifying, oh, when the man of God says this, I got this. Okay, you got this for what? What's your path? What's your lot? What's your calling? What's your election? Christianity is becoming witchcraft. Witchcraft, total witchcraft. Right? People just go to... Huh? They've given me a cow. And they got to... Then the next day they go for their point. Hey, what do you want? Hey, a million dollars. I got a million dollars. And then you testify. No. Either understand the order of the spirit or go for short fixes that will cost you even more. Because I've, at the end, the end, you see, I've seen people who have been excited over little small things. And then in a couple of months, years, it's gone. I thank God that I had an opportunity to meet some old men who have spent 50 years in the gospel. 50. When you hear them talking, you feel sorry for our generation and how they see the gospel. Two, three years of shining and the guy loses the course and the way. He starts to look at the gospel as royko. Something you simply mix in food to get test. Praise God. Talk to God. Tell him, God, what is my part? If my part is there, Help me play it well. You, you see, having children is wonderful, but there is more than that. Having a wife and a husband, it's all part of the things that accompany salvation, but there is more than that. Having a nice house and a car, all of that is wonderful, but there is more than that. There is more to life than the things that fulfill our pleasures in the flesh. And the most important aspect for every believer that you should walk out of this room tonight is your path, your lot. What is your purpose in the gospel? That is more important than the woman you marry. That is more important than the house you live in. The Bible says, even having children. Some of you think that children is the best thing that ever happened to you. No, God is. God is. Maybe you are struggling because your path is not clear. Or you are in the path but you're missing the order of the house, of the spiritual things. You, you play in the things of God. You ignore the instruction of the altar. You see, when you're faithful with a little, God trusts you with more. Some of you when we tell you bring five, bring ten. We don't tell you that because God can't bring people. How did you come? We prayed you here. But we tell you that we might give you a sort of responsibility that you can account to God too and say, God, when you told us to do this on the altar, we did it. Praise God. You also have to get to a point where you learn to sacrifice. Sometimes it might not be money. Some of you only end in money. I'm talking about time. Sacrifice time for the kingdom. Sac sacrifice time for the kingdom. It will always come back to you. Good measure, press down, shaken together. You might never have money. Yes, I know that. But sacrifice time for the things that concern the kingdom. Listen, some of you don't even have reasons not to serve. You don't have them. Huh? Do you understand? Eh? 
But because you have a nice colon and you're smart, eh? you feel too special to arrange a chair. Eh? <laughs> this is the house of God. When you enter there, you're the children of the Most High. Do anything that serves. Anything. Be dirty for Christ. Just be better for Him. Let them know that that woman is a multi-millionaire in dollars, but when it comes to the house of God, there is nothing she cannot do. Even up to now, there is nothing I cannot do in the house of God. Nothing. Nothing. Yes, I'm apostle great, anointed man of God, but there is nothing I cannot do. Praise God. Great is your mercy for me, your loving kindness for me, your tender mercy I see day after day. If you're here and you've never received Jesus, eh? no, you want to be born again, come. Now you, you want salvation. Come. Come. For you, say you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Hey, anybody want to be born again? Repeat this word after me. Repeat this word after me. Say, Jesus, I believe that you died and rose again for me. You shed your blood on the cross for my sin. So tonight, I receive your free gift of salvation. I believe in my heart and I confess in my mouth. But you are the Son of God who gave His life and came in the flesh for me. He was raised for my glory. And I met Him, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Venero, make manifest.